Welcome, Greek Q Nation, to episode number 473 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our fifth book just came out. It's called Perseverance and How to Be a Great Fraternity or Sorority Alumnus. So go pick up that book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, inflation on food prices and affordable housing seems to be a major problem for young folks today. These issues are going to be the cornerstone of debates ahead in both the national and also the local political races. So I wanted to get some perspective today on these issues as it relates to college students. And our next guest is going to absolutely have a wealth of information for you. His name is Roger Friedman. He's a fiscal conservative, former senior vice president of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, and a chartered retirement planning counselor. From this no-nonsense background, he sees the world from a clear-eyed perspective and feels duty-bound to do all that he can to help put the nation that he loves, America, back on track. His new book is called Erasing America, Broken Politics, Broken Country, will help galvanize concerned Americans to get off their couches and get to work to get America back on the right track. Roger is a proud member of the Sons of the American Legion and actively supports charities and assists first responders and military families. His other books that he's written are very interesting. They're called uh, Forging Bonds of Steel, How to Build a Successful and Lasting Relationship with Your Financial Advisor, Fire Your Retirement Planner, You, The Mindset of Retirement Success, A Parent's Guide to Your Child's Retirement, and also 18 Wealth Lessons That Will Transform Your Thinking. Welcome to the show, Roger. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm happy to be here. Hey, it is an honor to have you on the show, and I think it's just very timely now that we're starting to ramp up here in political season, and we really need to start thinking about the future of America and uh, some of the issues that we see here, certainly I talked about it in the intro, you know, inflation, I think, uh, you know, specifically food prices just seem to be really, really outrageous. And I also think about the American dream. Can young people afford uh, housing? I, I mean, I just think it's so out of reach and the interest rates are so high that I, I'm really concerned for them and, and if that American dream is still alive. Um, now, before we get to all of that, you know, we have this thing in common. It's called SUNY. Uh, we both are grads uh, of SUNY. I went to SUNY Buffalo and you decided on SUNY Brockport for your undergraduate experience. So tell our audience, why did you decide on SUNY Brockport of all places? Well, it really had nothing to do with academics, Michael. <laughs> so at the time, I really was not having a great relationship with my dad. Uh, my mom had passed when I was 12, so my dad was, you know, always keeping an eye on me because I had behavior issues, you could say. So I chose the college that A, I was invited to, and B, was farthest away from my dad while being State University, which cost $62 a credit. So... Uh, that's the story, really. That's the story. You know what? You and I are very much alike in that sense. You know, my parents, uh, they were fighting. They were about to be divorced. I didn't know it, but they would be oh, divorced boy. Two, two years later after I started college. Uh, and I had two younger sisters at home. So I was shielded from a lot of that because I was just in Buffalo. I, I was in a different uh, city. And, uh, you know, it was um, all same thing. I wanted to get as far away as possible uh, <laughs> that I could. And it had to be cheap because I was paying for it. And I exactly. didn't have an unlimited budget. So, exactly. So we went to these places, I think, for identical reasons, uh, for sure. Now, you know, I've read a whole bunch of stuff where you have all these regrets about your political science degree that you got from SUNY Brockport. So explain to our audience, what is the problem with higher education, in your opinion? And what would you do differently now if you could do this whole thing over again? Oh, boy, I would do it very, very differently. I, I, I'd own Tahiti by now. OK, <laughs> so what I have learned over the years is that college does not teach you to be successful. OK, and there are courses out there that are absolutely ridiculous. And many students choose to take those courses. And I, I found a number of them, and I was actually stunned by some of the nonsense that I saw. There are courses on Lady Gaga. There mm -hmm. are courses on Star Trek. 
There are co courses on walking. There are courses on, you know, mountain climbing with a smile. I mean, the fact that you would pay, pick a number, $900 mm -hmm. for a course on walking. Okay, how is this going to develop a skill that'll make you attractive in the marketplace? So I get it. When I was in college, you know, back in the dark ages, um, I took courses that in retrospect, I shouldn't have taken, okay? I took constitutional law one, two, three, and I was a teaching assistant for constitutional law four. What did I think? I was gonna be a constitutional law expert and get matching 401k? You know, it never, ever happened. Um, I visited Washington as part of the Washington semester program, and I was very, very disillusioned by spending time in Senate subcommittees, these people couldn't agree on what bagels to buy for breakfast, <laughs> okay? So what I see colleges failing at is teaching hard skills mm -hmm. that are in demand in the marketplace. Yeah, A lot of kids are skating, unfortunately. And yes, it's fun to skate, I get it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, listen, I, I completely, I agree from where you're coming. There's no question about it. I think that's probably why I'm such a big fan of the fraternity and sorority system, because I think there are all kinds of skills that you need to develop in college that employers want you to have, you know, right. talking about public speaking skills, for example, budgeting skills. And, you know, many of these students are managing, let's call it a six figure budget for their fraternity or sorority. Um, so there are certain things that you get out of it that I feel like if you just went to class and back, you probably wouldn't have any of that expertise. Right. You're talking about gaining excellent experience. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, I think I was president of the debate society sure. for, I don't know, maybe one semester. Mm. And it was wonderful because yeah. I learned debating. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really important skill. I mean, you know, listen, you're going to come into contact with all kinds of people in the workplace and you're going to have to work with everybody, every political stripe out there, uh, every age out there, every generation out there. I mean, you name it, you're going to find it and you have to work together towards a common goal. And again, I mean, that's another thing you develop within fraternity and sorority is just leadership and figuring out how do I manage, you know, these 60 guys that are all 18 to 21 and they all want to go off in different directions and they all have their own agenda. How do you get them to work together towards a common cause? And if you can it's figure like it out in cats. college, yeah. yeah. If you can figure it out in college, I feel like you can do it anywhere. So, um, you know, I think your background is also really interesting because you're a former senior vice president of Morgan Stanley. You're a practicing chartered retirement planning counselor. You're a fiscal conservative. And I know that at one point you were up to your eyeballs in debt. So how did you get back on the path of financial autonomy? When I joined EF Hutton, a name you probably remember in 1980, I had four credit cards. I had a Visa and Master from European American Bank and a Visa and Master from Manufacturers Hanover Trust, neither of which even exist anymore. Right. And I had credit limits of, Michael, are you ready? Mm -hmm. $700 <laughs> on each card. Wow. <laughs> you could tell they had a lot of faith in me. Right? They didn't trust you at all. <laughs> exactly. And... I would max out each card. I would take a cash advance from one card to pay the other. I was up to my eyeballs and I'm like, I got to stop this because I kept buying things that were depreciating in value. Hmm. Not a good idea. I didn't learn solid economics and finance in college. I, I took micro and micro, macroeconomics, a lot of good that did me. Elasticity of demand has nothing to do with going over your credit limit of $700. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think we have to really watch it. I remember vividly in college, we had these fundraisers where we would get money to sign other people up for credit cards. I mean, we would have a table. I remember that. Yes. Remember that? 
we would have a table out in the student union and we would get money for each person that we signed up. And of course, everybody in the fraternity would sign each other up and we would all have credit cards. And the same thing, there would be a bunch of brothers that would just get into just all kinds of financial trouble and just yeah. way too much debt. And I think, you know, looking back at it now, how stupid were we? Because it just wrecked a, a whole bunch of people's credit, yeah. essentially. And like you, I spent far too much time in the student union. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no question about it. So Seymour C- Student Union. I never <laughs> got to know who Seymour was. But... <laughs> but yeah, but you sure spent a lot of time in the building. I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I, I agree with you. And also the depreciating asset piece, too. I remember graduating from college and I figured, well, I graduated from college, so I've earned it. And so I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a brand new Ford Mustang depreciating asset. Uh, and, you know, it's just in hindsight, you know, I probably should have just bought a used car that would get me to work and back. But of hey, course, I bought an eight track stereo. I'm right there with you. Yeah. I mean, for what reason? For what purpose? It's just like, you know, especially young, you know, I want people to start thinking about compounding interest and saving that money, because here's the thing that all of our college student listeners have that Roger and I don't. It's time, time. And there is a time value of money. And if you can live within your means early on and not go for the brand new white Ford Mustang out of the showroom and just get a used car that gets you to and from, then all of that money you can put away in time value of money. You're right. I would own an island in Tahiti if I made better Michael, you are spot on. So the last seven cars that I purchased, Mm -hmm. and I got a, a Mercedes in February, have been used. Yeah. I buy used cars every single time and they're gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to be smart with these depreciating assets. Uh, you know, as soon as you get off the lot for a brand new car, that car is instantly worth a significant portion less the exactly. moment you drive off that lot. And so if you can save money just by using getting a used car, you can get a nice used car for a little money that gets you where you want to go. So Think about stuff like that, especially when you're young, uh, I think is really important. Now, every time I go to the grocery store, I am just blown away at the prices right now. I'm like, what is going on? Why am I paying so much? What is food food inflation? And how in the world are we going to stop this? Well, let's talk about it from two different angles. All right. Uh, You know, me, you know, I ate ramen noodles in college probably four to five days a week. I wouldn't know a vegetable if you threw it at my head, okay? (laughs) So let's talk about, you know, eating out, okay? Mm -hmm. So kids like to eat out, you know, I get it. And there are a whole bunch of great restaurants, you know, in every college town. Mm -hmm. Last year, according to Restaurant 365, which is a gigantic trade group, 80% or more of restaurants raised their prices last year. Over 60% are raising their prices in 2024. Think about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. And it is because of employee problems and expenses and minimum wage and turnover and insurance and everything else, and also supply chain issues. I don't know if you read, but uh, the Panama Canal, there is a drought. And so there's literally 30 ships waiting to transit the canal that can't get through. Mm -hmm. Knives and forks, plastic ones from China. I mean, on and on and on, there are still supply chain issues that no one even knows about. And the fact is that the rate of increase for eating out is going up higher than the rate of increase of eating home. And I would tell, you know, college students, you know, go to the store, find something, hopefully organic, which I know costs more. Simple ingredients, cook at home, impress your friends, your girlfriend or boyfriend will go, did you make that? And, you know, you'll be a star. Hopefully you'll save a little money. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I've basically stopped eating out and uh, we just get everything, uh, groceries uh, at the house and I've become a stellar cook. Who knew? Uh, and, uh, waiting for you to invite me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I surprise myself some days, um, but everything's you know good with garlic. Can, yeah. yeah. I think it is something that you can get better at. And just like yes. you said, I mean, if you're dating in college and you know how to cook, 
Let me tell you. You'll be a star. Okay? You are a superstar. You are a rock star. So develop those skills early and yes. save money. It's a win-win, guys. And throw <laughs> the ramen out. Right. Forget about the ramen, okay? Actually learn how to cook, you know, with fresh meats and fresh vegetables, uh, right. rice, pastas, et cetera. If you can do that, you're going to save a lot of money. And uh, and listen, I know because I got a, a you know a sophomore in college, and I have uh, my daughter is going to be starting at Rice University in Houston, Texas, um, right. this fall. And I know how much it costs for those food plans. Okay. Oh yes. Food plans are very expensive, and I got to tell you, my son he saved a ton of money his freshman year by completely avoiding the food plan. And him and his friends, they go to Costco, they go and buy food in bulk. So they bought- That's rice, exactly rice. the thing to do. Yeah, they buy bulk chicken, bulk, you know, rice, pastas, all of that stuff and, and vegetables. And they got one guy who's a, a chef, okay? The guy is a college student, but he is a chef. And six kids all. share the membership, $10 each. Right, they share the membership, they share the food and they'll buy it in bulk. And then they split up the food evenly. And I'm telling you, it's brilliant. Genius. And he is saving so much money. He's also a fiscal conservative. He's saving so much money. And I'm blown away at just how smart he's being. I want everybody to do what he's doing. I think it's great. Um, really I good guess. stuff. Now, listen, many of the college students that I work with today, they all want to be rich, okay? They all want like this get rich quick scheme. How do I make a million dollars tomorrow? Maybe they think it's going to impress other people by driving nice cars, having big houses, uh, fancy vacations that I see on Instagram, et cetera. What is the real reason why college students should want to be rich? What I've learned in my career is that the more that you earn, the more that you can give. So Michael, let me give you a very real example. This actually occurred with somebody I know. So this person, their sister was blind and they were not a well-to-do family. And the sister got a huge amount of help from an organization, I think it was called the White House for the Blind, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there are other organizations that help the blind, but this one had a tremendous impact on the family and directly on the sister's life. And this guy, uh, went on to become very successful. And you could say he's rich. Yes, he drives a Lexus, he has a nice car and all, all that goes with it. And he also gives $25,000 every year to the White House for the Blind as a thank you for what they did for his sister. Mm. The more you earn, the more you can give. I'm a very big believer in that. I give to Team Rubicon, a Wounded Warrior Project, the Gary Sinise Foundation, Tunnels to Towers. I'm nuts about our first responders and our veterans, and I'm so grateful for them that I want to give back in any way I can. So I write charity checks every single month. And if people want to learn how to be successful, this is my book, 18 Wealth Lessons That'll Transform Your Thinking. Look at the subtitle, Why Prosperity Seldom Taps You on the Shoulder After Years of Anti-Wealth Programming. School does not teach you how to be wealthy. They do not teach you how to be successful. Lord knows you don't got to learn more about Lady Gaga, okay? So the thing is, you need hard skills. I help teach hard skills in that and my other books, but taking finance courses, you know, the esoteric economics courses, they'll always be there, micro and macro economics, but take personal finance courses, take an accounting course where you're spitting nails trying to do the spreadsheets and the, you know, income statements and balance sheets and scratching your head and saying, I can't do this right, do it anyway. Mm -hmm. You got to learn a debit from a credit. And as Robert Kiyosaki said, guess what? Your house is not an asset. Go mm -hmm. figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, I think that's brilliant. Uh, listen, uh, I'm an accounting major. Uh, it was not easy. Uh, you know, I remember being in a lecture hall with 500 students at SUNY Buffalo 
as an accounting major freshman and the professor said, look to your left, look to your right. They will not be here. On They're going to be gone. Yes. The question is, are you going to still be here? And he was right. I mean, most of people, you know, they ended up going into other fields, marketing. Uh, they ended up going into some economics, um, but, you know, just other areas in the business school. And I tell you what, I, accounting I have a love hate relationship with accounting. Of um, course you do. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it was not easy. It was the, one of the most difficult majors we yes. had at the University of Buffalo, and I ended up getting into the field and starting work as a staff accountant. And I got to tell you, I was bored to tears because it's either a debit or a credit, and there's nothing in the middle. There is no gray. Uh, you know, you know what they do with creative accountants? They send them to jail. So yes, I, they, they do. <laughs> but I'll, but I'll I'll tell you two things. Number one. I've never known a poor accountant That's and true. I've known scores of them. Right. Number two, and I will send this to you, Michael. This is something that I created called um, 25 books to spur your thinking. It's a suggested reading list for success. I will send it to you and feel free to, you know, uh, spread it around on your, on your podcast and web website. Absolutely will do. And I agree with you. I think that's a really good accounting is a good foundation for entrepreneurs and other things, because guess what? I do all my own taxes. I never have to depend on an accountant to do my business taxes or personal taxes. Um, and I know if the business is making money, I understand balance sheet and income statement. So I don't need an accountant to tell me if the business is making money or not. I know in real time. And that makes me an effective owner of an entrepreneurial venture. So, you know, th this might be an interesting exercise. Gather up 10 students. Let's call them juniors, for example, mm -hmm. and ask them the following questions. Do you know how to negotiate a lease? Do you know the various accounts at a bank? Do you know the basics of opening up a retirement account? Do you know about goal setting and goal planning? Okay. These things are not taught. Right. And they don't have those skills when they get out of college. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely an issue. Now, I mean, speaking of college students, I want my kids to prepare for retirement. Uh, right now, they're a freshman and a sophomore in college this fall. So what are the types of conversations I should be having with them as a parent to get them ready for retirement? It's funny you should ask me that, Michael. I am going to send you my book, A Parent's Guide to Your Child's Retirement. 21 thought-provoking lessons to have with your adult child who's in, in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Because the last thing that you want to do, let's say you have a daughter and she's 28 mm -hmm. and she's working. Mm -hmm. And she says, dad, I just got granite countertops in the, ho in the house. They look wonderful. You say, how much did you spend? She says, 7,500. I put it on the credit card. Michael, you'd pull your hair out if you had more. If I had but more. I designed the book so that the conversation paths do not look like a ninth grade bad report card in English, mm -hmm. okay? You know, you want to have substantive conversations that are positive so that there's a give and take and it's not, you did what, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are certain things that should be done and every time they earn $1, there has to be a plan for how that dollar is split up. For example, 62% um, might go to current expenses and taxes, 10% to charity, 10% to wealth building, X percent in a retirement account. But there's got to be an accounting for what happens to every dollar that comes in. And I don't care if you got it from Aunt Maggie for Christmas, from Uncle Joey for your birthday, or from your employment. Every dollar that passes through your hands, there's got to be a plan for it. Because mm -hmm. okay. otherwise, it's going to go to money heaven. You know that. Oh, yeah. Very, very good. I'm going to have to check out that book. I think that's awesome. You know, I'm I will send it to you. Yeah, please do. I'm concerned about our national debt. I, I'm going to be really honest with you. I think we're placing a huge burden on our children, and I don't think it's fair to them. And I and also I, I also have I call you know strikes and balls you know fairly. I think both parties are allowing this to happen and allowing it to continue. So what is the solution for our national debt here? You know, you asked probably the hardest question. And I'm not smart enough to know the answer, but what I can tell you a couple of things. Right now, we're verging on 36 billion of direct debt. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a hell of a lot more 
that are that is off the books. And, you know, there's the question of, you know, will the Democrats raise taxes more? Will the sunset provisions of the Trump tax cut, you know, be allowed, you know, to expire and they don't change anything because that'll automatically bring up taxes. And the Democrats feel that, you know, the higher the tax rates, you know, the more they could pay down the debt. Well, I've never really seen that happen. And I'm 68 years old. OK, uh, the Republicans, uh, you know, make a good story of being fiscal conservatives. But then when they vote in Congress, they're like herding cats. Right. There are the Tea Party people that say no increases. There are others that say, you give me this and I'll give you that. You know, the, the old horse trading. Mm -hmm. OK, I've seen the Democrats vote as one block quite often over the last 24 to 36 months. Mm -hmm. I don't see the Republicans do that anymore. It's yeah. it's everyone, you know, uh, on their own. But there has to be an accounting for the government, the country cannot afford to do X. So we will not fund X. For example, you know, getting rid of student loans. I'm sorry, you, you unless it was fraud, you signed on the dotted line, you got the benefit, you're stuck with whatever major you took that was your own decision. You are responsible to pay that back. And the nanny state is not here to bail you out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many billions have already been spent on that? I think it's over 70 billion. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just, you know, one example. But I don't think the debt could ever be paid back. And you're right. Our great grandchildren are going to be responsible for it. And I don't mean they're going to be responsible to pay back the treasury bills that the treasury issued last week. They're just going to keep paying taxes, you know, higher and higher just to service the debt. Yeah. I mean, if you go back and you look, you know, over time, I think the last time we had a surplus, I think Bill Clinton was in office. Yes. Uh, you know, so clearly both parties, just like you said, I mean, you know, the Republicans call themselves fiscal conservatives. But then in actuality, they don't vote that way. And so like, I, this is, I, I, if I had hair, I would be pulling it out. Like who on this planet is going to fix this? Because we have to start taking steps in the right direction the same way that you were able to eliminate debt for your own personal uh, finances. I think we have to take the same kind of steps on a national level. I just don't think it's right. And I don't think it's right to burden our grandchildren with this debt. I think it's awful. Um, and we have to fix this. I, and I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. And, and I have a problem with a lot of people in Congress that are calling for increased subsidies to every class of people. We're going to pay for free education. We're going to give you Medicaid, Medicare, cell phones, debit cards. This There's no money to pay for all of this. Right. Yeah, there really isn't. I feel especially like for people who are not citizens. Yeah, well, yeah, these are our promises that we can't pay, and uh, you know, obviously, with the goal of getting elected, but uh, it's just really, really troublesome. I, there's got to be a solution here, but uh, I'm not sure what it is. I don't know that we're going to solve it today either. I, I, yeah. I, I didn't get the memo on the solution, so. I'm, I'm going to have to rely on you, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the younger folks to realize just how bad it is. Um, you know, also, I love that you're working on assisting first responders and military families. I have nothing but respect for our U.S. military uh, and the work that they do every single day uh, and first responders as well. And the college students that we're working with, these fraternities and sororities, they raise a lot of money for various causes. But I can't think of anything better than first responders and military families. So, I mean, are there specific organizations that you would recommend there that you think are really doing a good job? Because you are writing those checks, and I'm sure you're checking them out to make sure that they're doing what they say they're going to do with your money. There, there are organizations that build homes for vets. Mm -hmm. It's the Gary Sinise Foundation. And if you remember him, he played Lieutenant Dan. Oh, yeah. In that movie with Tom Hanks. Um, yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, Forrest Gump. Horace Gump. So yeah. he played Lieutenant Dan. Yeah. yeah. And he is now a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. uh, he has his own band. They go around to military bases. He has raised tens of millions of dollars for vets and first responders. Uh, tunnel to Towers. Uh, but also, let me give you an idea that might be good for fraternities and sororities to implement. 
Mm -hmm. I do this in my local neighborhood. So there are a number of restaurants around me and I found the ones um, that I like where uh, first responders and police officers go for lunch. So I gave them 20 of my books. I gave them $200. And I said, the next time a police officer comes in, you give him his lunch or her lunch for free, give him a copy of my book and tell him I'm grateful for them. Nice. Okay. And yeah. I've done that scores of times. Yeah. I just give my books away and I buy them lunch. Wow. Good for you. Okay. And yeah. that could be replicated with an interesting book, maybe written by students. Sure. Who knows? Sure. Uh, and that could be done in the local community. Yeah. That's a wonderful idea. I really like that. I hope some students will take that idea and run with it. You know, and speaking of good food, uh, I do get to Florida every now and then. You'd be surprised how often I get to Florida to go out and speak. I have two recommendations for you. Where should I go? Okay. The first is uh, near St. Pete. Okay. Uh, there's co It's called the Rum Fish Grill. It's in the lobby of a hotel. Don't remember the name of the hotel. Mm -hmm. They have a 40,000 gallon fish tank. Wow. Looking right out on the dining room. Uh -huh. And you are mesmerized looking <laughs> at all the sea life in there. Right. The other is in Clearwater. It's called Bascom's Steakhouse. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I went there for my birthday. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That's all I need to know. That's the spot I was looking for. Where'd you go for your birthday? Yeah, now Baskins. I know where to go for a good meal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's There's good. always a big ass Mercedes parked outside. <laughs> of course there is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So if our listeners, if they want to buy you all of your books and they want to connect with you, where should they go? They can go to Amazon, uh, where people buy 99% of their books. Mm -hmm. uh, my book on the problems with America is called Erasing America, Broken Politics, Broken Country. But for many of your listeners and viewers, I would say the 18 wealth lessons would be a great start so that they could see what they need to do to be successful. And hopefully they'll take an accounting course or two, make you happy, make me happy and become a successful citizen of the U.S. Amen. Uh, from your lips to God's ears. The name of the book is 18 Wealth Lessons That Will Transform Your Thinking, written by Roger Friedman. So go and pick that up on Amazon. His new book also is called Erasing America, Broken Politics, Broken Country. So you can pick up that book as well on Amazon. Roger and Friedman, what can I say? Just wonderful work today. Thank you. Last but not least, visit my website, eocritic.com, short for Equal Opportunity Critic. And I could send you my several times a month newsletter. Fantastic. Go sign up for that newsletter on eocritic.com. And uh, Roger, what can I say? Thank you so much for sharing a wealth of information as I knew you would uh, with our college student listeners. Michael, thank you. Of course. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this talk with Roger Friedman, I want you to like it and I want you to share it on social media with other folks that also need those 18 wealth lessons that are going to transform your thinking. There is nothing better than getting started on the road to financial security by starting now as college students. Again, what you have that Roger and I don't have a lot of is time. And so that money will compound over time. Now is the best time to get into good habits. Don't repeat some of the mistakes that Roger and I made. We've made a million mistakes. We just want you to avoid doing them so you're more successful than we were. <laughs> exactly. Very good. Well, thank you so much to our listeners. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you on the next episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Mm -hmm.